Thank you very much. Uh, so there's a slight modification to my uh, presentation uh, in the title, uh, and it's directed energy surgery. Will it replace current practice? Uh, as you know, I've spent a lot of time in the military and doing a lot of uh, research and classified research as well. Uh, and it's about disruptive vision. And I throw this out here because on the 8th of uh, April, the Department of Defense uh, unveiled its new laser system as a weapon system. Uh, this has been in development for about 20 years, and it has come to fruition. Many of the technologies that we have today owe their origins to the basic research that was done out of the Department of <coughs> Defense. Uh, a personal view on my side with the revelation of, revelation of this particular system indicates to me that there is a major shift in the way militaries are going to be doing business, if you call it that, in the future. And that's going to be by manipulating energy rather than using mechanical instruments. And this is just the beginning. On the diagnostic side, we've been using and improving our diagnostic energy-based systems, uh, satellite-based systems that are allowed to send down various forms of energy, whether it be uh, radar, near-infrared radar, uh, lasers and so forth, and getting information that we can't even get when we're prowling around on the ground and seeing things, and also getting them from our larger vision. So this is going to be the theme of what I'm going to present to you as what the next generation might be in surgery uh, 15, 20, or even 50 years from now. So we are entering a new age, the information age, but it's not only about information, but it's about energy as well. And it's about how we as surgeons can use this to enhance our performance beyond anything we've ever done. As you recall, we now use scissors. But when we, as a species, were born, we didn't have scissors. We had teeth and we had claws. And now we actually have scissors and we also have other instruments that are moving forward. So looking at things like robots and lasers as something magical or different is not the case. It's just one more way for us to do things that our physical body is not capable of doing. Seeing things that we can't do, can't uh, normally see. We, the, the advantage to this is the electromagnetic spectrum, how physicists look at the energy that's available to us, is huge. And although we've exploited one or two parts, for example, on the short end, our, we were looking at x-rays, at the long end, we're looking at radio waves and so forth, there's this enormous spectrum of energy that's out there that we can use, and we're using about this much. So the potential for manipulating energy is massive, completely revolutionizing the direction that surgery would go. And so here we are, these are a few areas that we are actually using energy, but it is less than maybe four or five percent of the energy that's available that we could control and change the way things are going. Why energy systems, imaging and robotics? Because when we look at these systems, what they basically are are information systems. And these are the, the, the systems that allow us to control anything, including uh, energy, if you will. So it's about exploiting the, inf uh, the uh, uh, energy spectrum and in the information space. Now, it's all also about interacting at a different scale. Our colleagues, our medical colleagues, are talking about what? They're not talking about large things anymore. They're talking about small things. They're talking about genetics, metabolic, uh, meta metabolomics, proteomics, and so on and so forth. They are beginning to understand from the basic sciences that we now can control the various processes within the human body at the molecular level. As surgeons, we still are in the Renaissance. We are the measure of all man. Uh, uh, man is the measure of all things. We're looking at things in centimeters and in meters in size when the rest of medicine is looking at things at microns and nanometers in size. The importance of that is we now have technology and devices that allow us to interact on that level and to be able to change the way that we move forward. For example, uh, it's about controlling energy. It gives us accuracy. Right now, we are talking about doing things at the millimeter and centimeter size. We can move down to the micron size and the nanometer size. Uh, 
we can also look at power. Instead of having massive instruments, we can use tiny instruments because it takes small amounts of energy to drive these small systems. Things happen quickly when you move down in scale. We have femtosecond lasers. What does that mean? You can do one pulse is 10 to the minus 15th second. If you look at this in the reverse, that means every second this system conducts one billion complete operations. I don't know of any human that can do more than one or two things per second, let alone thousands, millions, or billions. The technology today is allowing us to do complete activities at micro and nano scale. <clears throat> so what this allows us to do, it allows us to build intelligence systems, intelligence systems that we control and supervise, but that work well beyond human performance. For example, if you shine in a laser light on a piece of uh, a tissue, you perturb the system, you add energy to it, some of it's absorbed and some of it's reflected, and then you look at the reflected light and it tells you the composition of that particular one. In addition to that, once you know that particular composition, if you have an, the same laser but at a different wavelength, you can use this for therapy. You can turn on and turn off the laser quickly and you can destroy the tissue. Uh, we have a number of instruments that the Department of Defense has developed that looks at the tissue, analyzes what it is, and has a cutting laser that determines whether they should cut the tissue or not. This works at a 50 millisecond cycle, which means that every second we can do 50 procedures. I don't know of anyone who can do 50 operations in one second, but that's what this is capable of doing. So when you look at it from this perspective, and so what is it that we are doing? Well, we're manipulating molecules, we're destroying tissues, and we're doing it very, very precisely, not only at the micron or the uh, millimeter scale, but also doing it very rapidly with diagnosis and therapy tied together. So the fundamental change that we see here is we're moving from tissues and instruments, which are things that we used at the macro scale, to information and energy. Information allows us to control the energy, and the energy allows us to do things at the molecular level that we previously were doing at solid organ or tissue level. Intelligent instruments are the result of this. Here are some of them in the laboratory. For example, this is uh, uh, a grasper that was developed at the University of Washington Biorobotics Lab. It has five sensors within the tip of the instrument. And every time you begin to squeeze it, 50 times per second, it completely analyzes what is happening to the tissue in terms of pressure, strain, stretch, or blood flow, and gives that information back to you. And if you do it by closed loop, what you can end up doing is limiting the amount of pressure you would be based upon the blood flow. And it will do that 50 times a second so you don't crush the tissue as you move along. We can make these things even Where's smaller something? and smaller. Here is a, a grasper. It is not manufactured, but rather it is uh, it excised out of silicon, the same way that we do a chip. This is a fully functional instrument that's at 0.5 millimeters in size, working every bit as, lar as well or even better than what we have on some of our larger size instruments. So, and I mentioned to you, this is the, uh, the prototype from uh, Physical Optics about the laser that has two lasers, the diagnostic and the therapeutic. The diagnostic one analyzes the tissue. In this particular specific instance, as soon as it sees a blood vessel, it instantly turns off the laser so it doesn't cut the blood vessel. And then as you continue on, as soon as it no longer detects the blood vessel, it's actually able to turn it on. This, this is one example of the direction that we're moving by adapting some of our military technologies that we've got into the area of healthcare. <clears throat> and once again, I've repeatedly shown this one about the robot as a, an information system and controlling all these. The robot has a precision greater than a human has, 10 times more precise than any human could possibly ever hold an instrument. That's the precision that we need in order to direct the energy exactly to the level that we want. This is the type of system that we need to be able to do molecular surgery, to do cellular surgery, and to move our focus, the great big large organ systems, down to the molecular systems that we've got available today. Uh, once again, here's a combination, high-intensity focused ultrasound. This is the therapeutic ultra, uh, uh, part of ultrasound. When that yellow dot went on, that was when the ultrasound machine was turned on, and that little white line indicates the tissue that was coagulated in this lens. 
The military thought this was a uh, uh, great value, particularly for the battlefield, for coagulating bleeding. So the experiment that they did down at Brook Army Medical Center was they used the standard hemorrhagic model of laceration of the internal iliac artery. All pigs die within 15 minutes. Here's the diagnostic ultrasound, and you can see now that that internal iliac is lacerated. But this has high flu, high intensity focus ultrasound as part of it as well, pressing the button at exactly the area where the bleeding was. When you tool the ultrasound back on, there's no more bleeding. This is all done non-invasively, uh, not even percutaneously, but just directing the energy exactly where you want to and causing the effect that you would like to have. Just one example of what's out there in the laboratories and could potentially be the direction that we are going. Another area that I'm very keenly interested in plasma medicine, which at the moment is mainly a surface phenomenon. Uh, plasma, as in plasma physics, is what, you ha what happens when lightning strikes. It energizes the air, if you will. And in the past, it used to be very high temperature and you needed a vacuum, but now we have something called cold plasma. And these are the things that we see in that cloud when we analyze what happens when the energy is released. And we, we see charged particle and free electrons, we see reactive species, like reactive nitrogen and reactive oxygen species. We have ultraviolet visible light. Uh, we have a high temperature if we would like to do that, and we also have electromagnetic radiation. Each of these forms of energy interact at the molecular and the cellular level and allow us to control processes within there. For example, <coughs> for wound healing, uh, it will selectively turn on and turn off angiogenesis, VEGF, and other healing factors. It will also be able to uh, activate specific mechanisms like coagulation. And it, the result of this, and I'm not going through the, the list that we have here, it allows us to accelerate uh, coagulation, it increases the rate at which wounds heal, and probably its most important effect is it kills every known biological agent. We have demonstrated this repeatedly, including on the antibiotic-resistant bacteria that, we had, that, that were killing our soldiers over in Afghanistan. And it turns out it kills every single one of them with a small hand-portable instrument in 30 seconds. And if you replate these things, at least through six or seven generations, they're not able to develop resistance. Very interesting. And it does not damage tissue. So we have a, a device now that is handheld portable that can stimulate wound healing and that can decrease or eliminate totally any chance of infection locally without any chance of them develop any resistance to them. Once again, these are the things in the laboratory that the military is exploiting or exploring at this point in time that I think are going to point to a new direction in the future. Femtosecond lasers, I mentioned them, 10 to the minus 15th seconds uh, per, per pulse. And what you end up doing is allowing you to make an incision in a cell, open the cells, and manipulate the individual organs. <clears throat> At the University of Dundee in Scotland, they focus this on the nucleus. We're able to make an incision in the nucleus and remove bad parts of genes and insert new parts of genes. So we have the opportunity now, instead of injecting people with viruses and hope that we change their genetic component, you as a surgeon may be able to sit down at an, a workstation not too much different than the ones that we have available. We'll have to relook at how we understand and how we do this. By that I mean when you activate uh, an energy system, it changes the protein and it changes the color of it, not the shape of it. I'm getting the time to close. Let me just show you a couple of quick examples and then we'll finish. Uh, hyperspectral analysis, there you're allowed to shine a laser light onto the udders of a cow and it automatically directs the positioning of the milking machine and automatically is able to milk them. Uh, in the industry, two and a half chickens per second are totally scanned, completely two rotations for 100 different biological agents to ensure the quality that there's no contamination. Two and a half seconds to do 100 different ones. And we're, we, we've seen some of the applications in biophotonics in terms of uh, Barrett's esophagus and photodynamic therapy. Um, and low-level light therapy is another area that we're looking in. And for those of you who flew in here, terahertz imaging, which you go through in the air 
airport as a scanner, they've just discovered that there is a way to manipulate that level of energy and use it for therapeutic programs as well. So in essence, there's a massive opportunity out there that we're just beginning to exploit that we've never even looked at in the past and it allows us to go down to the molecular one and work more integrally with our medical colleagues who are now doing all their discoveries at the molecular level and radio surgery and so forth. I'm going to take a minute of your time and talk to you about one of the most transforming types of uh, technologies that are coming today. 3D printing. How many know what 3D printing is? Right. This is, may very well be more important than the internet. You can take a computer image of an object that you would like off of the internet, download it into your system, and be able to print that out. Here are some of the things that we've seen that are being done. Of course, most of you know about Tony Otala, who's using 3D printing to print kidneys for transplantation. Also that we can do is we can do it in, in uh, commercial products. Uh, Nike, Adidas are, are allowing their shoes to be printed at home if you've got one of these 3D printers. Uh, the latest version now is about $2,500 uh, and it looks like a microwave oven. And when you press the button, the objects would come out. So this is the direction that we're going. Once again, it's all about information flow and about the manipulating of materials and molecules at the molecular level allowing us to do things that had never been possible before. So that is the pitch. I hope you all are inspired by a new direction that I think that we can take. It's going to take us 10 or 20 years. It's going to take a lot of work on a lot of people's, but once again, it's going to transform the way that surgery is going to be performed. Thank you.